All right, uh, this is the first lecture of 2401, uh, the lecture portion. And I'm going to be lecturing today on chapter 9, which is the joints or articulations. Now, you may say, well, you didn't give us lecture uh, chapter 8, which is the, all of the bones. However, I'm going to omit that for lecture. So your test number 2, which I will be putting online this week at some point, as soon as I can, will consist of only chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7. So I'm going to put that up this week, make it available online, and you'll be able to take it through Blackboard. Uh, but just remember that we're not going to, I'm not going to give you a, a questions over a list of the bones because you're already doing that in lab. So what I'm moving on to today with this chapter, chapter 9, the articulations is the material that you'll need for the beat to, uh, to take ultimately test 3. Okay, so test 3 is going to consist of 9, 10, and 11, joints, muscle tissue, and the muscles, which I may reduce as well. So let's begin at the beginning. I'm going to jump off frame for a second. Don't worry. I'm back. I got the stick. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, how joints are classified. And you may see that it says joint classification structural. So how they're built. If you see structural, think how they're built. And there's three basic types of joint with their own subclasses. So the first type of joint are called fibrous joints. And these are how they're built. So think of if it's structural, how your house is built. It's made of wood, it's made of stone, whatever. This is what they're made of. So they're, they can either be, if they're fibrous, they can be sutures, which are those little joints that hold your skull bones together. Uh, they kind of look like a puzzle piece. And they're really tight and they don't move at all. We'll talk about movability, uh, flexibility later. Syndesmosis, and that's a big confusing word. You may see syndesmotic or syndesmosis. Syndesmosis, just plural. And what these types of joints are, are uh, fibrous joints with a little bit of, uh, sorry, they're fibrous joints with uh, a little bit of more movement to them, okay? So similar idea, but uh, slightly more flexible. Um, you'll find that in the joint between your, your ulna and your radius, for example. And then gonfoses, which are uh, peg in sockets. So there's a, 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 piv, a, a socket and then a peg fits into that. So this is like, for example, your teeth are gonfoses. Next, we move on to the cartilaginous joints. So these are going to have some fibers as well, but they're going to add cartilage. So cartilaginous joints, there's just two types. Synchondroses, and I know these words are like alphabet soup here. I feel for you. Um, syn together, chondro cartilage. So they're joints that are held together or contain cartilage, and they're pretty tight. So a synchondrosis, uh, example for that would be um, your uh, the growth plates of your bones when they're growing. So those, the plates where there's that hyaline cartilage in between the ends of the bones as they're, as they're elongating, that's a synchondrosis. And it does involve only hyaline cartilage. Next we have symphyses, or you may have heard of a, a symphysis. So a symphysis, you, and usually you hear the word pubic symphysis. Symphysis is just where two bones are held together and there's a little plate of cartilage in there. Uh, the difference here being that there's also that there's fibrocartilage. So a symphysis adds fibrocartilage, whereas a synchondrosis is just a hyaline cartilage. And then I'm going to move down to the most complicated joints, but probably ones you're more familiar with, actually. And these are synovial joints. Uh, synovial joints are found in six different structural categories. Again, this is uh, how they're built. So we have, and I'll just list them here and then I'll show them to you guys on, a, on, a, on an image. So plane or gliding, and this is where two pieces come together sort of in a flat surface. Hinge joints, and you can all picture a hinge like in a door, so it's going to swing open and close. A pivot, and a pivot joint is one, like my, my head's on a pivot. So my, uh, my atlas sits on my axis. My top vertebra sits on my second vertebra and swivels around on that single rotational point. Condyloid or ellipsoid joints. These are kind of like a ball and socket joint, which we'll get to. Um, it's kind of like a ball and socket joint, except for if you want to picture a ball and socket being really deep and the, the socket being deep and the ball fitting in there. An ellipsoid joint is more of a sort of a gentle curve, right? So it doesn't allow quite the, the range of motion as the ball and socket does. 
A saddle joint, if you picture a, a cowboy sitting on a saddle, that's kind of how this saddle joint works. Uh, your, this joint right here between your, um, your carpals and your first metacarpal is a saddle joint. So it can go kind of in a couple of different directions. But the structural shape of it is, is like this. So that's what they call a saddle. And then ball and socket joint is going to be a real deep recessed socket with a ball uh, entrenched in that. An example of that would be your shoulder, right? Mine's, mine's a little wonky, but uh, that's how they work. So let's move over here and look at our, our, uh, our synovial joints. So these are these examples, these are vis visual examples of the structural types uh, uh, of synovial joints. And here we have that first one that I pointed out to you. That's a plane or a gliding joint. There's some examples over here which will be useful for you. Um, and there's an image of one. That's your clavicle sliding along on your um, on your the maneuverium of your sternum. Hinge joints. We got a, we got a bunch of different kinds here. We got a bunch of different locations for them. These are really good right here. There's some hinges. Can you see that? Is that on camera? So there's one. There's one. My knees one. Mm -hmm. Pivot. There's that atlas and axis, as I promised. Uh, this proximal ra radial ulnar joint. You don't have to know these locations of them. They're just there for for your uh, for your information. Um, but if you if you ever, this is how you're able to do this. I don't move my upper arm. I'm just moving my 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 forearm because this radius has a little round head on it that'll kind of rotate like this. It'll It'll pivot in that little socket. The ellipsoid joints, and there's that baby ball and socket shape that I told you about. Uh, this says radiocarpal, but let's look at this one better. The metacarpophalangeal joints, numbers two through five. So metacarpophalangeal, these terms may sound Greek to you right now, but that's th these are my metacarpals, back of my hand, right? These bones right here, and this is two, three, four, five. And this is the phalanges right here. So the joint right there between my, my knuckles, right? These first set of knuckles, the ones you punch something with. That knuckle is this type of joint. So it's gonna go, you can do a little, you know, swivel there with it, right? Uh, <clears throat> saddle joint, there's that thumb joint I was talking about. Uh, this is the one that instantly goes, if you can do this trick. You ever do that one? That's that joint cracking. So that's that, it feels really good too, you should try it. Uh, you can see the little cowboy sitting on a saddle there, right? There's the horse and there's the cowboy, he's got bow legs. And then lastly, the ball and socket joint, which is uh, example, exemplified by your shoulder here. Real deep cup there in the saddle, I mean the socket, and then a really nice uh, ball that inserts in there. Okay, I'm gonna cut for a sec. All right, hi there. Uh, it may seem like I'm still here, but I just came back from getting some water. So I'm um, continuing with synovial joints, and what we have up here is an image that shows you some of the important components of a synovial joint. So your synovial joints, which are all these really wide, wildly movable types of joints, have got a lot of stuff keeping them together, right? And I'm just gonna kinda give you a list here and point them out and tell you what they do. Uh, they, where was I, on the first page, have um, cartilage, so this is, Hyaline cartilage, this little blue surface here represents hyaline cartilage. They call it articular cartilage because it's at an articulation or a joint. And contrary to popular belief, cartilage, joints don't rub cartilage on cartilage. You don't want things to rub. You don't want, you, even cartilage will uh, wear down cartilage. So what you want instead is you want to have a little joint capsule right here, a cavity, that's filled with stuff called synovial fluid. And so this acts just like the oil in your engine, in your car's engine, and it keeps those parts for, away from each other. It's kind of a, you know, self-contained little package here. So as liquids don't compress very well, when you push hard, the liquid just gets more resistant to that pressure. Uh, interestingly, the articular cartilage itself produces this synovial fluid. It's like, uh, just like any, most every fluid in your body, it's gonna be a blood derivative, so it's derived from your plasma. Uh, and the harder you push on it, the more it secretes. So joints that are under pressure will tend to produce more synovial fluid in a process called weeping lubrication. So it's like the, the synovial, the articular cartilage 
weeps, it cries out the synovial fluid under pressure. Um, there is an articular capsule. So this articular capsule right here, which is kind of really both of these parts, consists of a waterproof inner part called the synovial membrane and a tough uh, fibrous connective tissue part on the outside called the uh, fibrous layer or fibrous capsule. This is dense, irregular connective tissue. You guys remember that? Uh, next, we move to the ligaments, which you can see a couple of examples of right there. Ligament, ligament. So this is your shoulder. So whichever ligaments those are. Uh, this one's attaching. This is your uh, chromial clavicular, probably, uh, ligament. Uh, being, has been cut. This is your AC joint, most likely. Um, these ligaments, I don't know what they represent, but these are going to go from uh, bone to bone. So ligaments connect one bone to an adjacent bone and kind of stabilize that, that whole joint area. You have little sacs called bursae. So bursa is a single sac, and a bursa is act, acts like if you have a little water balloon. If I filled a water balloon and I put my two hands on it, you can see it's between bones, right? So it's between bones. If I put a water balloon here in between my hands, and did like this, that water balloon would reduce friction tremendously. If I did, took the water balloon away, that's friction right there. So it kind of rolls in between uh, bones. Tendon sheets are kind of the same thing in that they provide a friction reduction between a, a, a tendon and maybe an adjacent bone that that tendon's rolling over. So uh, if, I took, if this was a tendon, if this stick were a tendon and my hand were a bone and I did this, it's gonna like saw through my hand eventually, right? That scraping is gonna damage the ligament or the bone or both. So a tendon sheath acts kind of like, there's these little worm things, I don't even know, this little kid's toy, that it's like a rubber deal and it, you grab onto it, it'll slip through your hands and you can't catch it. I don't know what they're called, but um, the inside of the sheath is not touching the outside of the sheath and this inside then this cavity is filled with fluid. So as this tendon moves this way and that way, that tendon sheet kind of unrolls within itself and prevents it from scraping. If you get damage to those, you can have some uh, repetitive motion injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome and so on. Um, not shown here, but what I want to mention are uh, menisci. A meniscus is a fibrocartilage disc or chip or wedge or something that you're going to put in between bones to, that are really under a lot of uh, a lot of impact stress. So your knees, your intervertebral joints, your temporomandibular joint. <clears throat> you also have some fatty pads, again, not shown really, um, but there would be some fat in and around that joint to provide cushioning and some, some stability as well. Uh, that's about it for articular joints. So I can now move across the room to here we go. Let's see if his steady cam is working. Look at this, folks. <laughs> to this little tiny table right here, uh, very simple, uh, which says joint classification functional. So all that stuff I was talking about over there was all prior to this structural classification, how it's built. This tells you, and I, I mentioned about how it moves, but this is the terms. These are the terms that describe how the joints move. So. Synarthrotic joints or synarthroses are immovable. So if I, if I was going to say a joint that's immovable is synarthrotic, I could give you an example of a, of a structural classification that is immovable, and that would be back over there, if you remember, the suture joints. That's your skull bones being held together. They don't move, right? So if I said suture, that's the structural classification. And if I said, what's the functional classification of a suture? You would say synarthrotic. Get it? That's how they're related. Uh, amphiarthrotic is slightly movable. Um, a lot of a couple of your fibrous joints and a couple of your cartilaginous joints are slightly movable. Uh, that this distal radio ulnar joint right here can move around a little bit. If you if you can you can wiggle it sometimes you can feel your bones moving independent of each other slightly, but not a whole lot. Uh, you don't really have to know any examples of this. Um, Diarthrotic joints, these are the very movable ones. So this is where we can make a clear distinction between the, the different class of the structural classifications. Uh, diarthrotic joints are always synovial. 
synarthrotic joints and amphiarthrotic joints are always either fibrous or cartilaginous. So if it's not completely movable, it's not a synovial joint. If it moves around a little bit or none, it's either fibrous or cartilaginous, and that's good enough for me. Now, let's, I'm going to do some, some acting now, not really acting, but I'm going to do some demonstrations where I'm going to show you how, like examples of joint movement. Is this good, Brian? All right, so you got to get me on. Can, my, can you see my legs, crane style? All right, so uh, let's talk about some movements. So flexion and extension. A lot of confusion about this, I think, because people think muscles flex. Muscles do not flex. Muscles contract. So when I contract a muscle, when I contract my biceps brachii, my elbow flexes. Flexion describes a decrease in the angle between two bones. So I'm flexing my elbow. That doesn't sound very intimidating, right? Flexing your muscle sounds intimidating. Flexing your elbow not so much, but that's what you're doing. So that's flexion. Extension is simply the opposite, increasing the angle between two joints. Good enough, right? Bend your knee, bend your fingers. That's flexion. Extend them either. That's extension. Now we have abduction and adduction. So abduction and addduction. So add is when you bring two things together. So I'm going to add the whatever's in my left hand to whatever's in my right hand, bringing them together. So what the definition would be moving towards the midline, moving your limbs towards the midline. So every time you see a gymnast get ready to, they do that at the beginning, they've just probably adducted their legs and their arms together. Now, when I do, when I do a jumping jack, I'm gonna, I have abducted my arms, because they go away from my sides and my legs. And then I'm going to go back down, adduct. So ab, ab. Uh, circumduction. Circumduction. Now you can look these words up. I don't have them written down anywhere. Circumduction is like a cone-shaped movement. So when I point my hand at the camera, I'm going to circumduct my uh, arm at the shoulder. Right? So I'm circumducting that. You can do that just moving something around. I can circumduct my finger. Right? Okay. Uh, inversion and eversion. This is this involves my feet. I don't know if you can see my feet from there. This is this is a, a term that describes movement of your feet at the ankle. So I'm gonna invert my feet. Invert is moving my the soles of my feet inward. Eversion is a little harder, but like that, right? So that's everting them. I kind of knock knee myself too there. Uh, next movements are protraction and retraction. So pro means forward, re means backward in this case. So I'm going to protract my my head. I'm going to protract my whole head. Right now I'm going to protract my jaw. Now I'm going to retract both. So protractions forward, retractions backward. Uh, elevation, depression, okay? What do you do when you don't know something? You elevate your shoulders. So I'm elevating the shoulders. I can elevate my jaw. Now if I depress it, I'm just gonna go the other way. So that's that movement. Um, lastly uh, is just opposition, which is a, a neat movement that we have uh, restricted to our, our, our fingers and, and uh, thumbs, right? So whenever you heard that, whenever you hear the term, humans have a fully opposable thumb, what they're saying is that they can oppose their thumb to all of their other uh, digits on their hand. Cool. Now we shall go to, that was number two, finishing number two. So now I'm going to talk about leverage. It's okay. So let's walk over here, or Brian can roll <coughs> over here to the screen, <coughs> and we'll look at some levers. So here's there, there's there's only three different type of lever. All right, and there if you can remember this little acronym, F R E free. Right? If you can remember free, you can remember the first, second, and third class levers. So F means fulcrum, and a fulcrum is the thing that you, you kind of pivot around, right? So this is a fulcrum right here. My, my fingers 
represent the fulcrum of this stick, which is straight, um, weirdly the exact same thing that we have over here, right? So over here we've got a, a teeter-totter or a seesaw and with the little part, the, the whatever hinge in the middle. So when you two kids get on there and they go up and down, they're alternating the roles of either the effort, which pushes on the thing, or the resistance, which resists. So if I did, if I put a little kid on this end of this thing down like that, and then a big kid over here, and I set them down real fast, the big kid is the effort, the little kid's the resistance, and you're gonna rotate like that, and the little kid's gonna shoot off, right? But that's that's how it works. When you have when you push on it like this, that's gonna be alternating effort, resistance, effort, resistance. An example of that uh, is your, uh, it's actually what they're trying to show here, is your whole head, which has got a fulcrum right in here at that atlanto-occipital joint. And then these are some muscles that run down the back of my neck so that when I want to, and my face is going to be the resistance because if I relax, I'll just fall forward. So if I want to rotate around that fulcrum, I just contract these back muscles. And if I want to move it forward, I'm going to contract these neck muscles. So it's just a teeter-totter. My head's just a teeter-totter at that point. So fulcrum in the middle, first class lever. Resistance in the middle, second class lever. And this is a wheelbarrow. So if you picture this thing being a round thing instead, right? This fulcrum being the wheel on the front of a wheelbarrow. And then this is where I grab it with my hands. I pick it up and I have a bunch of cop doo doo in here, whatever I'm moving around, right? I don't know, we put in wheelbarrows. And I'm gonna pick it up using the effort and it's gonna rotate around this little fulcrum point here. And then I can push it forward. Now I'm not gonna do this one on camera because I'm behind the desk, but this is the same thing as when you stand on your tippy toes or plantar flex your feet. So when I contract my gastrocnemius muscle and my soleus muscle here, I'm gonna pull up on that calcaneus. That's where your Achilles tendon inserts, incidentally, uh, FYI. So just pulling up on it like this, and it's actually gonna force that thing to rotate, your, your body being the resistance. This whole human that goes off camera, off screen there, is the resistance that's gonna cause that human to lift up, rotating around that, that, that uh, ball of your foot. So resistance in the middle, second class lever, there's a good example. Third class lever, efforts in the middle. So we're gonna be pulling in the middle. Now you may think, well, if this is pushing down and this is just balanced here, it's gonna come off. They're attached, okay? So the fulcrum in this case would be like your, uh, your uh, humero ulnar joint. So this, where your, your humerus and your ulna meet right here in this little uh, uh, olecranon. So, this biceps muscle attaches down here to the radius, attaches right on this little radial tuberosity. And when I contract that biceps muscle, which is attached here in the middle of this uh, limb, it's gonna pull up and then the resistance, whatever it is at the end, if I've got a weight in my hand, if I'm doing curls or whatever, if I was doing a curl, a dumbbell curl, that would be a, uh, using a third class lever. Fulcrum in the middle first, resistance second, effort third, just remember free in that order, and you'll go one, two, three. FRE is one, two, three. Now, a slightly more complicated thing that I feel the need to discuss is the difference between a, let me go back to this, the difference between a, what they call a, a power lever and a speed lever. And I'm just gonna forget that, and I'm not gonna tell you about it. So don't worry about power lever, <laughs> mechanical advantage, disadvantage. It's really cool, but eh. Forget. All right, so let's move on to the next thing, which is, it looks like it's the last thing. So let's go with that working theory. Um, so the very last thing is I'm just going to talk to you about, about uh, injuries or, or, or disorders, okay? So I think I can move over here now. He's fast. Not that fast. All right, so just some, some things that can go wrong with your joints, whether it be from an injury or from uh, something you develop over time. Uh, first thing is sprains. So you guys have all heard the term sprain. I've sprained something, right? Uh, a lot of times it's misused. They'll say, I sprained my you know, hamstring. You didn't. You didn't do that. Sprains are specifically 
stretched or torn or completely ruptured ligaments. So the ligaments go from bone to bone, right? Uh, a damaged ligament of any sort is a sprain. They can get, you know, there's first degree, second degree, third degree, complete separ complete, you know, separation of that ligament, one bone from the other. So if you ever sh separated your shoulder or whatever, where you, you fell and did like that, jerked it out, cowboys, uh, cowboys, quarterbacks get that a lot. I'm, I don't like the cowboys, sorry. Bears fan, they suck. So whenever you get your elbow jerked at your side after a defensive end hits you, and it'll jerk that shoulder like that, that's a, uh, a sprained ligament, and they call it a separation in that case. Uh, you can damage cartilage. So you can have torn cartilage. I right now have t a damaged labrum in my shoulder. So I've got a little ring of cartilage that cir circles that uh, glenoid cavity, and it's been torn. So there's a, there's a noticeable mistake with my shoulder. So th those don't heal very well. Um, they don't have any blood supply, or at least very poor blood supply. Uh, they don't have any nerves, luckily. You may say, well, it hurts. Well, that's the other stuff around it that hurts. But a, a cartilage damage is different than a uh, sprain. Next, we have dislocations. So now a dislocation is, it's gonna involve a lot of stuff. You can damage the cartilage, you can, uh, you'll probably sprain some ligaments, you could, damage some of the tendons and things in the area, uh, but it involves an actual disconnect between one, the joint. So it's real, a severe, a severe injury. Bursitis. You ever hear your grandma say that she's got bursitis? Well, bursitis is inflammation of one of the bursae. And a bursa, if you remember, is those little water blooms, right? The little water bloom between my, between my two bones. So when, if I, da if that bursa is inflamed or damaged or leaking, it's going to, reduce the mobility of that joint. And these kinds of injuries all get better with rest, right? You don't wanna work out a sprain or you know, fight through the separation or whatever. You know, it's bursitis, who cares? Take it easy if you get those. Tendonitis, I haven't really mentioned tendons specifically yet, maybe a little, but tendons are the connective tissue uh, structures that hold muscle to bone so that that uh, Achilles tendon that you have at the back of your back of your foot is a tendon that connects your gastrocnemius to your heel bone, your calcaneus. Ligaments go bone to bone, tendons go muscle to bone. And tendonitis is just inflamed or potentially damaged uh, uh, tendon. So again, these this thing gets better with rest and uh, you don't wanna just run, run through tendonitis. It's not something that'll work. Lastly is a big pool of disorders called arthritis. I'm gonna grab a pen, stay right here. So arthritis, these are bigger words, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write them down. Uh, so, equipment failure. Where's my producer? Arthritis. And three types I wanna talk about are osteoarthritis, which is your which is your run of the mill every day. Everybody's got it. Not everybody, but most people got it. Some of us have it more than others. Um, deterioration of the joint, right? Don't think of, don't get osteoporosis and osteoarthritis mixed up. They're not the same thing. Osteoarthritis is uh, just a general degradation of joint uh, functionality. It can be, um, you know, cartilage damage. It could be, uh, uh, synovial capsule damage, could be uh, getting some bony protuberances on some of your bones in that area. And it's just gonna cause pain and immobility. Uh, and you're we're probably all gonna get it, right? If you, unless you just float there in like a stasis tank somewhere, not moving, you're probably gonna get osteoarthritis. So hopefully it's not, the, it's not too severe. Then you have rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder. Can we say autoimmune disorder? Very good. So an autoimmune disorder is when your own immune system mistakes your tissue for uh, something that's not your own tissue, right? So it's gonna attack it like it attacks a bacteria or whatever. In this case, rheumatoid arthritis results in attacking the joint capsule. And it attacks the joint capsule uh, in general, but the joint, uh, overall 
and will cause the joints to lose function to the point where they, they barely move and they hurt all the time. If you've seen somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, they're oftentimes their hands are bent in sort of a twisted position like that, can't even imitate it, and the knuckles are very swollen, often found more serious at the, at the extremities, but not always. And lastly is gout, or gouty arthritis. <clears throat> gouty arthritis is when you, you start accumulating uric acid crystals, which is something that you normally urinate. You, you normally dissolve it and, uh, in your urine and, and, and release it. But uh, if you've got a couple of things, combination of genetics and diet and uh, size, you know, uh, body, body size, they're gonna combine to potentially get you this disorder. Um, those uric acid crystals cause apparently extreme sharp stabbing pains, oftentimes concentrated down around your toes. I've met, uh, it used to be called the, uh, the, uh, like the King's, King's arthritis, because um, only really rich people that had, that had access to these really fatty, rich uh, foods would, would get it, and they didn't have a life where they had to work, probably. Um, but now it's, it's become more common because these, you know, foods that aren't really especially great for you are becoming, or are more easily acquired. So every, every day people can get this now. Um, and I think that's it. So let me think, let me just one, do it once over here before we cut. That is chapter uh, eight, right? Chapter nine. Chapter nine, joints. Um, that's the first chapter of the third pile of material that we're gonna cover in test three. And I'll probably develop a, an online quiz for this chapter. I'm way behind on this stuff right now, but I'll do my best to get an, a, a, a quiz out for this chapter. And then the next thing I'll lecture on is, uh, is muscle tissue, which is gonna be a bit longer video. Thank you.